Guys, okay, so here's the thing that people have to realize. This whole thing with the way open source software is done right now, where like there's a package manager and everybody contributes and it's like code sourced from anywhere in the world and you just auto download it, that is not gonna last that long. <laughs> and the reason it's not gonna last that long is that I could almost guarantee you that there are at minimum thousands of people around the world whose job is to inject bugs into open source software for espionage purposes. Like, look, there are give or take 200 countries in the world. Most of those countries have spy programs. You could type source code from anywhere. It's very cheap. You don't even need to fly a dude anywhere, right? How many people do you think it's their job to just check shit into GitHub and NPM and whatever that has bugs in it? How do you think that's not a thing? And how do you think, how long do you think things are gonna go once people figure out that's a thing? How didn't they hack into the Linux kernel yet? I guarantee you they have. I guarantee you there's like fucking at least 17 serious exploits in Linux. Like easy ones. I don't even mean like, you know, obscure things. Can I guarantee that it hasn't happened to the Windows kernel? Um, no, I would bet that it has happened to Windows as well. The difference is with something like Windows, it's more expensive. A, uh, because you have to fly someone there and they have to work at an, a Microsoft office, right? And you can fire them and all these things, right? Um, B, because you would have to fit the bug into a feature set decided by whatever project manager, right? So there's a level of check. With open source software, all you have to do is add some major useful functionality to some program that makes a lot of changes, right? But like, look, you did something really useful that every, it's adding value for the people, right? And then you just put your bugs in there. It's easy. Um, you know, when somebody else is deciding the feature that's harder, it still can be done. Um, but C, companies still have some degree of QA before they put things out the door. Unlike, again, the difference between an actual company and like an open source project is in an actual company, somebody is responsible for the experience of the software, right? And that means a lot in terms of quality. Um, it still doesn't mean uh, as much as it used to, right? Um, and it doesn't mean that nobody ever does quality stuff in open source, but like it does mean there's just that extra layer of vetting that doesn't exist otherwise. The Linux kernel has police, but like you, d okay, you don't understand. If you say that you do not understand the magnitude of the problem and how easy it is, all right? It is so easy. If you're smart, imagine there is a programmer of approximately the same skill level as one of the Linux kernel police. Those guys are busy. All you have to do is make something subtle. Like you don't, see here, I'm not saying you add some lines of code that say switch to root and open a shell, right? Like that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about introduce very subtle situations where a variable can have the wrong value that normally that's fine. But when you combine it with thing B and thing C, it happens to produce an exploit, right? I'm talking about that. Things that you would not see by looking at the source code. I guarantee you there are people around the world where that's their job. X equals something instead of X double equal. Well, probably, but like even that is like a, a linter will catch that, right? You want things that linters won't catch, etc. 
yeah, Heartbleed, like, I mean, come on. That, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure they know who checked in that line of code, or maybe they don't, right? But um, Heartbleed was pretty subtle, but you can do things that are a lot more subtle than that, even. Payoff for Windows is bigger. Is it though? Because most servers are actually Linux. Like Windows is all the clients, but the servers are Linux. And so if you want to snoop network traffic, you want Linux probably. Or, you know, router, whatever router is running. There's no real protection from secret services. No, but we're talking about like DDoS attacks, right? If I'm China or the US, right, and I want my geopolitical rival to have a hard time, what do I do? I turn off all their computers. Okay. Like it's it's a it's a basic obvious fact of national security that you don't want to be vulnerable to that. I'm making it look very easy. There's like a thousand people whose full-time job every day is to think about how to do this and they have a lot of funding. I mean, I don't, I don't really know that, but I pretty much know that. It doesn't have to be easy. It doesn't have to be easy. Large companies with a vested interest in fortifying the kernel. No, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Sorry. You're just wishful thinking. You're just wishful thinking. If you wanted to fortify Linux, the very first thing you would do is put a cap on the number of lines of source code and start removing source code, right? Because more source code is more attack surface. Um, and you want to reduce the attack surface. That is the number one thing that you would do. Nobody's doing that. You're calling bullshit on that? No, I'm calling bullshit on you, bro. You have no idea what you're talking about. You're just making stuff up. If you can introduce a bug into Bitcoin, you can make billions. Not really. No, that's a different thing because Bitcoin is a distributed secure protocol. So you would have to like find a problem in the protocol, right? Or something. You can't like, you can't make billions on Bitcoin by hacking a computer, right? You can't even make billions on Bitcoin by having a malicious client. The design of the protocol is to prevent that. Okay. It's not like Call of Duty where you have a malicious client and you can see through walls. Bitcoin isn't vulnerable to that as far as we know. Why would I assume that? Because you disagree? Because you're disagreeing in a content-free way. I have been around the computer industry for decades and I've been inside companies like Google and Microsoft and I've seen how they work and I've seen what people pay attention to. <laughs> You so have you. Okay, so give me some actual evidence that that would be true. Give, just explain why that would be true. Do I think some of those people have become employees of the FANG companies? Guaranteed. Guaranteed. There is no way that there are not multiple, many state actors who are employees of all these companies. If only, like not even for bug planting reasons, but just industrial espionage reasons, right? It's guaranteed shitloads of that going on. If it's open source, then others will probably find your bug. No, look, <laughs> open source software is so buggy, right? This theory that if it's open source, then others will probably find your bug, has not proven itself to be true for like all other software with obvious bugs. So like, why would you expect it to be true for like cyber attack bugs? 
Examples exist of long-term bugs. It's worse than that. Find things with without long-term bugs. Anything. So that's all I'm saying. Look, the probability you guys can say you were here someday in the future when this actually happens, the probability that there's going to be a large scale cyber attack where somebody just turns off all the computers in another country, well, not all of them, but as many as they can get is a hundred percent. That will happen. Um, the question is, what is the mean time to that happening? And uh, how well defended is the person being attacked? All right. I'm implying that introducing a bug in an open source software is an order of magnitude easier than finding the bugs. Yes. Yes, that is true. How many lines of software get written per day? How, how much software is added to the universe per day? Now, again, this is not merely an open source problem, right? Again, this is also a closed source problem. It's a problem everywhere. If I worked for any large company, I would be trying to delete most of the lines of code, all right, while keeping approximately the same functionality. <laughs> over 9,000 million lines per day. Accurate. Yeah, there have been examples of cyber attacks so far, for sure. But <clears throat> what I'm saying is it's hard to believe that there are not a lot of sleeper attacks planted but not yet triggered by multiple parties, right? Like, how is that not true? So, like, people might have, you know, found one or two, right, by less sophisticated actors. There are more sophisticated actors. Like, there's, there's just no way this isn't happening. Would that attack change the software hardware industry afterwards? Maybe. Like, I would, I would categorize that as having a result that is very unpredictable. Um, I don't, I don't actually know what the outcome will be, right? I think probably the first thing that happens, you have to like war game this out, right? Like, what do you do? Well, you try to figure out where the attack came from and you either shut off the internet from that place or they've got VPNs, right? So you shut off the internet from everywhere, except they've got people in, in your country, right? So like you kind of have to shut down the internet at a very localized way and increase security between those local cells um, while you panic and try to deal with the problem. What would dealing with the problem look like? Figure out what the exploit was, boot a version of the system that doesn't have it, right? Um, I mean, it all, it all depends, like, um, it's hard to game out because, so the more subtle, and uh, the more subtle a bug is, um, the less control you have over what it does, right? Like if you could just put arbitrary code anywhere that you wanted, you would make something that like tries to stay alive on the network and reinfect machines that are up and all that stuff, right? Um, and maybe like, it's probably very difficult to inject something like that directly, right? But you could inject something that is vulnerable to that and then have somebody manually download that thing and propagate it around, right? Um, so you have to assume there's some kind of worm like that in the wild and you probably it's probably very hard to kill 100% of it because, again, if you're wargaming this out as a state actor, it's like we want some number of the infected machines to be trying to reinfect, but not all of them. You want them to sleep random amounts of time and wake up a week, a month, a year later and start reinfecting, right? So um, because if you can see the packets, you could like start walling that off, right? Um, 
So, I mean, you just you just start you have to start thinking through those scenarios, which I haven't done, so I can't I can't really propagate it. But just think like, what would you do if you were getting paid a million dollars a year to be a smart programmer working on this? Like, what what would you do to make it the best possible? fuck that country system that you could, right? How useful would this be instead of just nuking a country? If you nuke the country, uh, you don't get anything, <laughs> right? You, you get, you get, uh, um, you get a uh, poisonous atmosphere raining down on yourself, right? And they nuke you back probably, right? And also a lot of countries don't have nukes but can afford programmers. It's like a very different situation. Yeah, no, there's like, there's so much more of this stuff going on than anyone is aware of. It's nuts, right? So just, I'm just saying, be happy living in the current world because it will change at some point. I don't know when, uh, but it will change, right? Um, and think about how drastically the world changed due to COVID with like, like I thought COVID was going to be bad. I never would have predicted that everybody would have shut down their economy for a year plus, even though I thought it, I thought it was actually going to be uh, worse sim symptom wise than it was. Right. Just by going by early reports out of China and stuff. Um, it's a lot easier to imagine the internet radically changing than it is to imagine the world shutting down their economies. Right. Like it's just going to happen. COVID shutdowns are practice for peak oil. I don't think peak oil is a thing anymore. Like the USA, the USA has tons more oil now due to fracking. Uh, OPEC is kind of has no power now. Like and we've got a ton of alternative energy uh, plus, we're very close to the technology of being able to make oil by farming carbon out of the atmosphere um, at significant expense, but like you would just have to build some nuclear reactors and you could use those to make oil. So like it's, it's just not, it's just not that bad. really depressing. I made you want to stop programming. Well, um, I don't think that's the, I mean, you should know that all the code out there is really messed up, right? Like there's no question about that. Um, it's just, what are the consequences of that and when do they happen? <laughs> 